Turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis, chapter 24. This is a really interesting chapter because in this chapter we have a beautiful account of how Rebekah becomes Isaac's wife. And it goes into quite a bit of detail, and that's why we're actually breaking it up into sections. Last week, we covered the first nine verses, and I spent quite a bit of time explaining why Abraham required his servant to place his hand under his thigh while taking an oath. Now, if you want to get technical, it wasn't his thigh. Remember that the word thigh is translated from the Hebrew word yarek, which refers to a man's loins. Or if you want to get even more specific, a man's genitals. So what Abraham was telling his servant to do was to slide his hand under his genitals on the outside of his clothing and to hold it there while he took the oath. Now, as I told you last week, only a dying man or a man who thought he was near death was, uh, uh, would require someone to take this type of oath because this type of oath symbolized that your descendants, your seed, would make sure that the person kept his word. And if he didn't keep his word, your descendants had every right to avenge you by taking his life. Now, in our story, the Bible starts, or I should say, chapter 24 starts off with, Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the reason that's put in there is because it wants you to understand why he required the servant to take this type of oath. If he wasn't old and well stricken in age, he would not have required his servant to take this type of oath. So Abraham was old and well stricken in age and he didn't think that he had very long to live. Therefore, he required his servant to make this type of oath. Is everyone with me? Good. So Abraham's servant made an oath to Abraham to find Isaac a wife and he made that oath with his hand underneath Abraham's thigh which signified that if Abraham died before the servant fulfilled his vow he was still obligated to keep his word and if he didn't Isaac would know and he had every right to take vengeance on him on behalf of Abraham. Now that might seem a little barbaric to you but that was the culture at that time. So most of the content in this chapter is all about Abraham's servant finding a wife for Isaac. In other words, fulfilling his vow. So let's get to the story. Turn with me, if you would, to verses 10 and 11. Then the servant left, taking with him ten of his master's camels, loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for Aram Nehoram and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had his camels kneel down near the well outside of the town it was toward evening the time that the women go out to draw water now when we read that he took ten camels most of us don't think a thing about it but in that time domestic domesticated camels were very rare only the very wealthy owned it even one camel so when we read that he was able to take ten camels loaded down with expensive gifts it showed just how wealthy Abraham really was. Now, his servant set out for the city of Nahor in Aram Nehoram. And let me show you where that's located. Look at the map up on the back screen. The area of Aram Nehoram is located in Mesopotamia. It's the area between the Euphrates River on the west and the Haber River on the east. So let me just kind of point that out to you. This is the Euphrates River. See that word? This is the Euphrates River, this is the Tigris River, this is modern day Iraq and it comes down towards this. But on this Euphrates River it goes all the way up here and then it circles up and goes up north. Then you have the Habor River. This period or this uh, particular area we're talking about is between the Euphrates River here and the Habor River here. So it's right in here. And the city of Nahor is next to Haran. Now this is about 500 miles from where Abraham was located, which means that Abraham's servant would have taken about a month and a half to reach this spot. It wasn't a quick trip. I'll be there in two or three days, I'll find him a wife and I'll come back. No, it would take a minimum of a month 
but more, prob- more in probability, it would take him probably a month and a half. Now, when he got to the city of Nahor, the first place that he went to was the communal well. You see, not only did he need water, but you actually went there to gather information because that's where everyone in the community would get their water. Now, once he got there, he actually prayed to God for direction. Look with me, if you would, in verses 12 through 14. Then he prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar, that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Now, I want you to underline the phrase, make me successful, because that's the very first thing that he prays for. He wants God to make him successful. Well, the word successful is translated from the Hebrew word kara, which means to happen or to occur. So if you translated this literally, you would have to translate it as make it happen. So what the servant was actually praying for was for God to make it happen and make it happen today. Now, what do we mean by make it happen? Well, what's his mission? His mission is to find a wife for Isaac among Abraham's relatives in this specific area from his homeland. So he says, Lord, make it happen and make it happen today. And then he does something really interesting. He lays out a fleece. Now, most of us know what a fleece is, right? We've read the story of Gideon. Of course, the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon, and if you know who the angel of the Lord is in that particular story, he comes to Gideon, and he wants Gideon to be a deliverer, and Gideon says, oh, I'm not so sure about this. And as a result of that, he lays out a fleece. Well, we kind of use that as a figure of speech. And what we mean is, we put this, if this happens, then this must mean. And that's what a fleece is. It's kind of a figure of speech. So he lays out this fleece. He's going to wait and look for a damsel that he thinks might be the one. And then he's going to ask her for a drink. And if she not only gives him a drink but also offers to water his camels, then he's going to know that this is the one that God has chosen for Isaac. Now, that's what he was asking God for. So look with me, if you would, at verses 15 and 16. Before he had finished praying... Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. Now, at this point, the servant didn't know who she was related to. He had no idea. He's a stranger there. This is the first place that he stopped. He knew to go to the spring. If you want to gather any information, find out where Abraham's relatives live. This is the place you went. So he prayed as soon as he got there. And the first person he sees is Rebecca coming. And she's very beautiful. Now, as I said, he didn't know who she was related to. In fact, the only reason we know is because the person who wrote the story told us. She was the granddaughter of Abraham's brother, Nahor. And the reason that Nahor's wife was mentioned, Milcah, was because she was Nahor's wife and not one of his concubines. If you go back and you read the genealogies, Nahor not only had children from Milcah, but he also had children from one of his concubines. And so it wants you to know that Rebekah, I'm sorry, yeah, Rebekah was not a child of the concubine, but she was a child of his real wife his legitimate wife, which meant that she was considered to be a legitimate child, a legitimate heir. Now, she would not get an inheritance because that went to the males, and the males would take care of the women, but she was still considered to be a legitimate child who was supposed to be taken care of. But the servant didn't know who she was related to, at least not at this time. All he knew was that she was very beautiful. The word beautiful is translated from the Hebrew word Tobe, which means pleasing to the eyes, nice to look at. We would say it this way, she was good looking, she was foxy. And that was one of the qualities that the servant was looking for. But that wasn't the only qualities 
the, or the only quality that he was looking for. So let's talk about what the servant was looking for in choosing a mate for Isaac. First of all, he did want someone who was attractive. He wasn't going to ask just any girl for a drink of water. He was waiting for a pretty girl, a good-looking girl, a beautiful girl. Sometimes when we read this story and we read about his prayer and he says, I'm going to put this fleece out, Lord. When I ask a damsel for a drink of water, if she offers to also water my camels, I'll know she's the one. And so we kind of get the idea that he was going to ask every girl who came for a drink of water to see how she answered. But it doesn't say that in the original Hebrew. Basically what it's saying is, when I ask the damsel, what do you mean the damsel? There's a definite article there. It means that he's waiting for the one that he thinks would be a good mate. When he asks that damsel, if she responds this way, then I'll know. So one of the the criteria that he had was that she had to be good-looking. Secondly, he wanted someone who was virtuous. In verse number 16, Rebecca's virginity is emphasized. Look at verse 16. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. So not only does it say that she was a virgin, but the story repeats the fact by saying no man had ever slept with her. The first thing that we're supposed to notice about her, besides her being very beautiful, is that she was virtuous. She was pure. The third thing he was looking for was dependability. And, there was one, and that was one of the reasons that he went to the communal well. You see, it was the responsibility of the young girls to fetch the household water in the evenings. Look back at verse number 11. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside of the town. It was toward evening, the time the women go out to draw water. Now we need the water to be able to clean up, to be able to wash up, to be able to prepare for tomorrow morning. And so the young women are the ones who would go out to fetch the water. Now, as we see that, there were a lot of girls who would come and they would use that as a time to be able to gossip and to visit and to just have a good time. And so what he's looking for is a, is a girl that the family could depend on. A girl who wouldn't dally around, but would go straight there, get the water, and then get home. A girl that the family could depend on. Now, look at verse number 16. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. In other words, she didn't stop to visit She didn't look around to see what she could do and pass the time. Uh Uh-uh. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. Now, let me explain a little bit about the well that she's at. Many many times in the uh, Middle East, when you had a spring like this, you would dig down because you wanted to make it a well. The whole town would use it. And what you would do is you would make stairs that actually went down in one direction. You could fill your water up, and you didn't turn around and go back up. It actually made a complete circle, and you came up the other side. And the reason you did that is so you wouldn't be bumping in to the person who was coming down if you were trying to go up. And so what this is saying is literally it had staircases that you would walk down to the water, you would fill up, and then you would walk back up again. We went to many, of, uh, many springs like this when we've been to Israel, also in Jordan, and you'll find those in Turkey also. But anyways, she went down to the spring, she filled her jar, and then she came up again, which meant that she was very dependable. She wasn't there to visit. She wasn't there to gossip. She wasn't there to relax. She knew that she had a responsibility, and that was to get the water and to get home. The fourth thing that the servant was looking for was unselfishness. He wanted to choose someone who was willing to go above and beyond to help others. And you can see that when you look at the fleece that he put out. Remember what he asked for. When he saw a young woman who he thought might be the one who might possess these qualities, he would ask her for a drink. And if she not only gave him a drink, but also offered to water his camels, he would know that this is the one. This is the one that God wants to become a wife of Isaac. Now, think about it. Anyone who would stop and give a stranger a drink and then offer to water his camels was definitely not selfish. Giving a stranger a drink, now that's one thing. Okay, I can stop and I can give you a drink, 
But offering to water his ten camels was taking it to a whole nother level. And you'll see why I say that as we look at the next quality, the last quality. The fifth thing that he was looking for was someone who wasn't afraid to work. To water the servants' camels, Rebecca was going to have to go down the steps into the well, get the water, and then walk back up time and time again. You see, camels can drink a lot of water. In fact, camels who've gone without water for a long time can drink up to 20 gallons at one time. In fact, some camels can actually drink up to 25 gallons at one time. Now, if you have been stopping for water on a regular basis, they're only going to be able to drink about 5 to 10 gallons. But 5 is the minimum. If they're not thirsty, they'll drink 5 gallons. And if they've been watered on a regular basis, they'll drink about 10 gallons. But people, that's still a lot of water. And he had 10 of them. So you're talking about 50 to 100 gallons of water. Now, probably... The vessel she was using to gather water was a one-gallon vessel because they had to make them quite thick. And for a young girl, that would be heavy. Now, some had two gallons. But think about having to fill up a hundred gallons. And if you've got a two-gallon container, that means you're making 50 trips down the steps, back up to fill the trough. So you're talking about someone who's a hard worker. Because she didn't blink twice when she offered to water the camels and she started doing this. And that's my point. The servant had put a lot of thought into what he was looking for and how to find it. And he incorporated that within the fleece that he put out. In essence, this is what he was praying. God, here's what I'm looking for. Make it happen and make it happen today. Bring a woman who has all the qualities to be a good wife... And to let me know that she's the one you've chosen for Isaac, have her do these things. And he just laid it out there. And he said, if a woman comes and I approach her and I ask her for a drink, if she waters my camels or offers to water my camels and she does it, I'm going to know that this is the one you've chosen. Now, you have to admit these are great qualities to look for in a mate. Attractiveness, being virtuous, dependable, unselfish, and a hard worker. Now remember, they didn't have the New Testament. All of the Old Testament hasn't even been written. Moses writes the first five books. At least we believe that Moses wrote the first five books. I believe that. And so he wrote the book of Genesis. He's heard the story before under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's writing it down. But here's what's interesting. None of the other books of the Old Testament have ever even been written. So how did he know what to look for to make? Because they didn't have that scripture in Galatians, the fifth chapter, that talks about the fruit of the Spirit. So how did he know? He was a very wise person. These are the five qualities that he was looking for. And these are qualities that we should look for in a mate. There's nothing wrong with looking for someone that's attractive to you. That's why you make that first connection. But from there, we begin to look at characteristics that mean that they're beautiful on the inside also. And that's what he was doing. Now, after she finished watering his camels, the servant gave her two gifts, and he asked her two questions. Number one, whose daughter are you? And number two, is there room in your father's house for us to lodge there? Look at verses 22 and 23. When the camels had finished drinking, the men took out a gold nose ring weighing a becca, and two golden bracelets weighing 10 shekels. And a shekel is about 12 grams, so we're talking about 120 grams of gold. Then he asked, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? And of course, she tells him who her father is and that he's welcome to stay at their home, and then off she runs to tell her family. It's kind of interesting how the family responds. Let's jump ahead, and let's, let, let's go on up to verses 29 and 30. Now, Rebecca had a brother named Laban, and he hurried out to the man at the spring. As soon as he had seen the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms, and had heard Rebecca tell what the man said to her, he went out to the man and found him standing by the camel's, near the spring. Now, 
Verse 30 is added to give us insight into Laban's character. If you notice, there's kind of a weird jump. If you notice in verse 29, it says, Now Rebekah had a brother named Laban, and he hurried out to the man at the spring. We could have moved past verse 30, but he doesn't do that. It's almost like he takes a step back, and he wants to explain the motive behind Laban running out there. He says, as soon as he had seen the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms and had heard Rebecca tell what the man said to her, that's what caused him to run out. You see, Laban's hospitality is motivated by greed. He has seen the expensive gifts the servant had given to his sister. He heard about the tin camels that were loaded down with some very expensive things. So, of course, he wants this man to stay with them but not for the right reasons. Now, this is very important. And the reason it's important is because it gives us insight into what happens years down the road when Rebekah sent Jacob to stay with her family. If you remember, Laban took advantage of Jacob many, many times, time and time again. But the reason he did was because of his greed. So we're getting a little insight into Laban's character so we'll understand why he acted the way he did when Rebekah sent Jacob home to her family. Everyone with me? So Laban runs out there. He doesn't have the right motive. He really isn't that hospitable. But this person is very, very wealthy. And he has given his sister expensive jewelry. So let's go out and invite this man in. And he invites him to come home. And he prepared food for the servant. But when it was time to eat, Abraham's servant wouldn't eat until he told them why he had come. Look at verse number 33. Then food was set before him, but he said, I will not eat until I have told you what I have to say. Now here's what's interesting. A courteous guest in the Middle East would have said, Oh, no, 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 no. You've come a far far way. You must be thirsty and hungry. Let us eat first and then tell us. But Laban doesn't do that. This is why he's telling. He tells him, No, 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 no. Let's not eat. Let me tell you my story. And Laban doesn't even argue with him. What does Laban say? Laban says, Then tell us. His curiosity is there, and he wants to know why you're here with tin camels and all of these expensive things loaded on the camels. And then the, story lays out, or the, the servant lays out the story. And he ends the story by telling them that God had led him straight to Rebecca. So now the servant tells him, it's up to you to tell me yes or no. Will you? Or will you not allow Rebekah to marry Isaac? Look at verse number 49. So tell me, will you or won't you show unfailing love and faithfulness to my master? Please tell me yes or no, and then I'll know what to do next. Well, of course, after hearing the story, Laban and Bethuel agreed that the Lord had sent this servant to Rebekah. So how could they deny it? Look at verse number 50 and 51. Then Laban and Bethuel replied, The Lord has obviously brought you here, so there is nothing we can say. Here is Rebekah. Take her and go. Yes, let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has directed. So they're recognizing God's hand upon this situation. Providence. What God has led the servant to do. Now, it's at this point that the servant gave two types of gifts. One to Rebekah, the other to her family. The gifts given to her family were meant to be compensation for the loss of their daughter's services and for her potential offspring. You see, whenever you took a wife, you were taking away a valuable member of their family. And she was now bringing her assets, she was bringing her ability to work and earn for the family over to the groom's family. So in order to compensate that, or compensate them for that, you gave them gifts. Now, normally, it was a small token amount because this would have been a woman. Her greatest asset is she's going to be able to provide children. But here's what's interesting. Abraham has sent very expensive gifts because he's very, very generous. And he compensates them well. And then he gives gifts to Rebekah. Now, these gifts to Rebekah were simply a sign or a sign of goodwill. 
But there are some scholars that believe that the reason he did that was because he didn't feel like Laban would actually be generous in giving her a dowry. So he was basically giving her a dowry because her family wouldn't have done it. And it's interesting because as we begin to see the story later on and we see how Laban is, we realize that's probably true. Now, let's jump ahead to verses 61 and 65. Or 61 through 65. Then Rebekah and her servant girls mounted the camels and followed the man. So Abraham's servant took Rebekah and went on his way. Meanwhile, Isaac, whose home was in the Negev, had returned from Bir Lahairoi, best I can do, Bir Lahairoi, one evening as he was walking and meditating in the fields, he looked up and he saw the camels coming. When Rebekah looked up and saw Isaac, she quickly dismounted from her camel. Who is that man walking through the fields to meet us? She asked the servant, and he replied, it is my master. So Rebekah covered her face with her veil. Now, veiling the bride was part of the marriage ceremony at that time in the Middle East. When the bride came in, and one of the reasons we have veils today is because we're kind of capturing that, that tradition that comes in uh, to play here. But in their day and in their time, during your wedding ceremony, the bride would wear a veil. So what Rebecca was doing was she was veiling herself, and it was kind of an unspoken signal to Isaac that she was his bride. Because when she came along, also her nurse came with her and probably a few other servant girls. She wasn't coming alone. So when Isaac's coming out and he sees his old familiar servant, the one that he grew up with, and he sees the teen camels coming and there's these women, how does he know which one is going to be his bride? Well, it's very easy. Rebecca puts the veil on. This signifies that she is the bride of Isaac. Now, there's something interesting here. And I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself, and I'll mention it again next week. But if you notice, the servant said, it is my master. Why does he say, it is my master? Because when he left, he was under the impression that Abraham was weak and probably wouldn't be alive when he returned. Now, we're going to find out he lives another 35 years. He actually marries, and he's going to have children. Yes, and we're going to look at that. But here's what's interesting. When he comes back, what he thinks is that Abraham must have died. Now Isaac is my master. But here's what else is interesting. We find out that Isaac is not dwelling in the same place that Abraham is. Why? And from this point on, Abraham and Isaac don't dwell together. There's going to be 35 years from the point that Isaac marries Rebekah to the time that Abraham dies. And during that 35-year period, Isaac and Abraham are not in the same camp. Now, why is that? Anyone know? Have they grown too big? It's like Lot and Abraham again. They've got a split. No. Let me tell you what it is really interesting Abraham gets a second wind of strength he's kind of gotten that well, I always call it just a second wind and now all of a sudden he feels strong again and he's lonely Sarah's gone and he's going to marry now remember he's not sterile when Sarah couldn't get pregnant it was because of her not him and this child, Isaac, is the child of promise, and everything is supposed to be left to him. Now, if he remarries and has children, then guess what? The inheritance is going to have to be divided. So guess what Abraham does? Abraham takes all of his possessions with the exception of a little bit, and he says, son, I'm giving you everything. And he gives it to him, and they separate so that when he remarries and has children, they won't get a part of that inheritance because God has already told him he is the one that is to receive the inheritance and to take it all. And most people don't catch that. They just wonder, 
Why in the world was Isaac and Abraham not living together in the same camp? It's because Abraham's going to remarry, and he's going to have more children, but those children are not supposed to share the inheritance with Isaac. God is going to bless Isaac, and it's through him that the seed of the woman is going to come. And so we're seeing this supernatural blessing being passed on to him and him alone. Now, look at verse number 67. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah. So she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Now, if you don't understand the customs of the time, the Sitzim Laban, then it makes it sound like they didn't really have a wedding ceremony, that he was living in his mother's tent, and as a result of that, he brought her in there, he consummated the marriage, and that's what made them married. Huh? uh There's going to have to be a wedding ceremony. But before the wedding ceremony, he doesn't bring her into his tent. He takes her to his mother's tent. Sarah has passed away, but she still has a tent. We're going to explain that in just a second. But the reason he took her to his mother's tent was so that everyone would know that she was taking Sarah's place as the matriarch of the family. Now, after everyone knew that she was becoming the matriarch, she has now taken over Sarah's tent. She now marries Isaac, and she moves into his tent, but she still has a tent. Sarah's tent is now her tent. So what's the deal? Do they sleep in separate tents? No. Why did Sarah have a tent? Did she not sleep in Abraham's tent? Yes, she slept in Abraham's tent. So why did she have a tent? Because she had servant girls. And that's where her servant girls stayed. So even though she would sleep in Abraham's tent and she was free to come, they shared that tent together in the mornings. She would go to her tent where all of her servant girls would attend to her. And that's exactly what happens with Rebecca. So as we begin to read through the stories, sometimes it becomes a little confusing because we don't understand the, cult, the custom or the culture of that time. And as a result of that, we're going, Sarah's tent, Isaac's tent, what's the deal here? But she brings along not only her nurse who raised her, and we're going to find out a little bit about her later on, but also servant girls. So they will have their own tent, and that's where they sleep as she shares the tent with her husband, but she can go back and forth. Everyone with me? Good. And now we know the story of how God led the servant to fulfill the oath that he made to Abraham to find a wife for Isaac.